On today's show, we're going to com- compare our updated 2023 WBA draft boards, dis- discuss Michigan's win over Nebraska, Celeste Taylor's 20-plus per- point performance against NC State on Thursday, and more. Lotto Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome. You all to women's basketball. My name is Hunter Cruz and I'm a Saturday host covering the WBA draft and college basketball at large. Thanks for making Lost Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, Lost Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline. BetOnline has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline, where the game starts. I'm joined by my co-host, Joshua Welch. Joshua is a women's basketball content creator. You can be found at ENFP underscore hoops on Twitter. So, Joshua, let's get into our boards. We both updated our boards this week. Uh, that was kind of the plan all along to have our board come out at the beginning of the season, then update it again as we in, enter January. So I have my board with you. I don't know if you have your yours, um, your exact. I do. Yeah, let's right just do you some just... highlights. I'm, I'm not going to do uh, controversial ones that I did that didn't have as good of a week. So I'm, I'm just going to gloss over those if, if you want to look so, at Twitter. What, what was your, so, okay? <laughs> who was your biggest like riser and faller from the preseason play? Let's do it that way. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Biggest riser. I'm gonna go. Let's do someone that was on the draft board be, before and, and mm, then yeah. rising. I had Jordan Horston as a lottery pick. Now, um, I already thought the defense, defensive and rebounding game was there. The main thing uh, we talked about last time when we went on our draft boards uh, was just wanting to see Horston finish more, and she's absolutely doing that. Uh, oh yeah, she's. 55, I think 55% of the rim this season, which is a improvement from last season. So Yeah, so it, it's especially like the Stanford game was just the icing on the cake for me. Like, yeah, I, I definitely think uh, we could potentially have two Tennessee players get picked in the lottery. I, I don't have that yet. I moved Raquel a little back because she's just not getting the playing time that I want to be able to showcase other things. Like, I know she can score. I know she can rebound. Uh, but I, I do have questions on like her limiting her turnovers and then also on the defensive side, just um, what she's going to bring on a consistent basis. So my board didn't see a lot of changes at the top. My top seven stayed in the exact same order. Um, Aaliyah Boston, Haley Jones, Diamond Miller, JC Sheldon, Jordan Horson already had her at five near the lottery. Charisma Osborne and Rakia Jackson. I kind of bumped up Aaliyah um, Blackwell a little bit, just one spot. Um, like you said, you're, and, yeah. yeah. Like you said in your board, I just think her production. So we're just gonna. I'm not gonna make a lot of different takes because we haven't seen her a lot this season. So I want to see how she plays before. Um, yeah, I decided I she's a, yeah. right in the same area. And yeah, what really stinks is I, I thought she was going to go really well with Ray Edwards and. Um, there was a tweet this past week from um, Coach Colleen uh, that um, they're discussing with Edwards, her future, and it, it's not looking like it's going to be with Baylor this season. It just does not look like she's going to yeah. it's going to work out for whatever reason. So that really stinks and was really disappointing. And, yeah, I haven't heard anything new as far as what's the timetable. Is, is she okay? It, it, yeah, like it just said she was questionable for the next Big 12 game. So that's going to be huge because – She's a, a player that contributed so much in Missouri, and I, I think she was underutilized, and that's scary what, what she was able to do there. So so also on my board, I have uh, – this is probably my hottest take, but I jumped Aubrey Griffin into the first round at number nine. Her her rim finishing, uh, 75% or around that number, tops like almost all prospects, and she's a wing – her shooting is a big question right now, but she's taken like 1.3 attempts at 33%, but she's extremely long, athletic. The physical tools are there. She's starting to take it um to another level this season after that injury. She's a redshirt junior, so she could technically return next season or a couple more seasons as well, but I like mm-hmm. to say, okay, if because if, like almost all these players could technically return because of the COVID year, 
So I kind of want to take it as, okay, I want to rate these players as if they're going to enter. And if they decide not to enter, we'll just take them off later. If so we were I doing have... that at that option, I would have added Cameron Brink for sure. Cause she, no, no, birthday... but no, 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 but the difference is the difference is Aubrey Griffin's technically a senior. Cause she's a red shirt junior. Okay. Uh, Cameron Brink's an outright junior. So that's a little bit different. Okay. Okay. It's a little bit different. A little bit different. <laughs> All right. So, I'll buy it. <laughs> so who would you say is like your biggest faller from your first uh, board to now? Yeah, looking through. Um, Awasu, like I, I want to see um, her uh, like with Virginia Tech a little more. Like she got injured, unfortunately, earlier on. So I, I moved her um, a little further back. Abby Myers, I, I talked about her uh, in a recent episode, like, it's just not coming together on a consistent basis to a point where she was brought to the bench. Mm-hmm. So right now I moved her back to a third rounder when I had her as the last pick in the first round of my last one. So uh, yeah, I, I would say that's uh, my biggest follower. My biggest riser that I, I didn't bring up was um, Aaron Barnum of Arkansas. And I still think um, it's going to work out. The LSU game was really rough for her. Uh, and for Arkansas in general, especially on the offensive glass, like at one point when I was watching, it was 11 nothing LSU um, in offensive rebounds. So um, that will have to improve. But um, I just like uh, that she's a big that is able to distribute the ball. Um, she's shown potential on having an outside shot. That I, I just think the tools could be there. So someone else that's fallen a little bit for me, I'm still on the um... – Laisha me here train, but she fell a little bit. Um, the production offensively is the biggest concern with her. She's not shooting the ball um, as much as you would like from a wing prospect. I know she's six four, but some some call her a big. But with her size, I don't think she has a physicality to be a big, a big. So she's more of a wing, and that's kind of how South Carolina utilizes her. So I have her as a second round pick right now. And how I go about uh, ranking second-round prospects is kind of just taking shots because there's so many second-round picks. Like we saw a couple, like last year, a couple second-round picks didn't come over or they got cut in training camp. So even first rounders. <laughs> yeah, but so I, I just think like okay, like a me here, um, we could see something with um, Hirsch if she could she could be something at a high level at some point. Same with someone like Kiki Jefferson. I have her at 19. Um, just kind of taking shots at players that could be something. And we'll talk about Kiki Jefferson a little bit later. But um, another player I have in my top 20, uh, that's kind of um, – it's kind of probably the biggest hot take compared to where the mainstream has her is Elizabeth Kitley. I've heard the back the back of the second round. I just I, I, I still we, have her first round. Like, I, I don't know that she still produces enough. Like, mm-hmm. she definitely – Fell, especially after seeing the Tennessee game. But, man, I, I, I did not agree with that, her being so far back for you. <laughs> I, I just I just don't see the upside with her. I just, like, her role in college is not something I could see a WBA team utilizing her as. Because what team is going to allow her to get as many post-ups as she gets? Um, I know Double Down, they talk about it um, on their podcast as well, but the post-up – there's really only like five or six players that you'd consider to be like high level offense on post-ups. And I don't know how likely that is to be Elizabeth Kitley. Cause she'll probably be, if she's a second round pick or a late first round pick, I know we've seen, Oh, Minnesota take her at two. I, if that would, that would be the biggest, that's a fireable offense. If they took her at number two, that's a fireable no, offense. I, I, the only, like I was so tempted um, to put Jackson of Kansas there, but I, I definitely want to see more to see what it happens in in regular mm. Big Twelve play because she didn't really go up against any elite bigs. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. Uh, yeah, I, but her offense has just improved dramatically from last season to this season. Like, she was already there. Like, she was one of the most underrated defenders in the Big Twelve. Um, mm-hmm. So but I'm really excited to watch more of her games this season, and um, I'll be. Do- I'm trying to do this every two months, so I'm gonna do this again in late February. And if she keeps up the current pace that she's at now, she'll be my number one center. So I'm, yeah, I'm really so. excited to look forward there. Another one, really quick. Um, Esmeri Martinez had a, another really good game, and 
um, limited minutes because they they blew out Arizona State, but um, she again is really impressing me. She's another player that had it defensive wise and has improved their game offensively. So, so coming up, sure we'll dive into some more prospect games from this week, including Michigan versus Nebraska. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end, people start to head out. You think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? Even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance will go up. You lose your license. You lose your job. You lose your car. You kill someone. Everyone knows about the risk of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that doesn't stop um, everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on the roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Thanks for making Lost Women's Basketball your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter most to the biggest in stories and sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today, available on this app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. So let's get into Michigan against Nebraska. I know you are on, um, you're on the Leah Brown train, so... Tell me what it's you saw for player that was a big riser for me. Yeah. Like I had her late second round and now I had her firmly in there. I had her at 16th. So yeah. Like, so give me the, give me the pitch for her game here. Um, Pretty big performance against Nebraska. So give me the pitch for her game in this. One. Yeah. I just like her competitiveness. Like that's the, just the biggest thing that stands out. Like she's going to do whatever it takes to, to win a game. And you just like seeing that competitive drive to contribute in any way she can obviously uh, was able to put up a lot of points, but just like that with her size, she was still willing to get gritty and try to get some tough rebounds. She's making correct reads. Uh, she made a couple nice beats to Maddie Nolan during the game. Like, yeah, just really like her game. And again, the big thing for her is staying healthy because She has not had a full season yet with Michigan. Her last healthy season was when she was with Nebraska. So um, really curious to see how she does against Ohio State. Um, That will be starting here shortly. And I know that's a game we'll be talking about next week. But, yeah. Yeah. So the box score, 20 points, 7 assists, 8 rebounds, 3 turnovers, but she was 8 of 12 from the field. The shooting from outside isn't anything special, but she's one of the better mid-range scorers in the country, um, like at 60%, which is extremely efficient for, yeah. And really quick, going back to the outside shot, like every year until this one, she was shooting at a a high rate three-point wise, like just pulling up her hoop stats really quick. Yeah, three-point percentage-wise, she shot 32% last year, 30% the year before, 34%, 36%. So normally, like, she's in that 30% range, and I think it starting in the North Carolina game, something was starting to click. So if she can get closer to that rate, um, yeah, the, there's more to, to see from people scouting her game. Right now, she's at 21.4%, which is well below uh, her career average so far. Her her volume is also decreasing as well. She was at like three per, at three attempts per game early in her career. Now she's like down to two point three. So she's just getting. I think she's um realizing that her three point shot isn't as reliable as her mid range shot, and kind of moving mo- most of her attempts over there, which has been, benefited her uh, efficiency as we've seen yesterday. Um, as we saw against N- Nebraska. So another player I want to like touch on in this game was um. Was Philia, so she she had uh, trying to pull up the stats here. And what's been fun with her game this season is just her progression as a shooter. Uh, she was last season she was pretty below average, and she's gotten up to like forty five percent this season. Only a sophomore, she just turned twenty years old, I believe, a couple of days ago. Um, but she's been a big piece for Michigan this season. So she's yeah. someone I'm. 
she's someone I'm intriguing to continue watching and could 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 develop into a real like first round prospect. And that's um, yeah, we'll ultimately yeah, like, just pulled up her stats. Like it, it wasn't like other games where she's been able to contribute more. Like she only had 12 points in this one, uh, went four or 10, but she's been integral like to Michigan being a better team than I was expecting. I did not have them in the top five with just how competitive that conference is. And now, yeah, they're, they're a team that I, I think is competing for the conference style just with the depth that they have. It's really interesting. So, And I know M likes M- Maddie Nolan more than I do. Uh, just Hannah, as a shooting, spe- yeah, as a shooting specialist, I just prefer Hannah Jump. I just think the shots a lot quicker, and yeah, and I think that's um, a big thing with a but shooting she, specialist. Yeah, I think. But she did go four or six in this game from beyond the arc, so really good game. Like she's a quality college player. Yeah. I just, yeah, want to see how she contributes in other ways. Like it, especially when there's only thirty six players, just. Yeah, I, I don't know if she right. gets picked over other prospects. So let's get into UCLA, Oregon. You watched this game. Um, as you told me, this was the best game you've seen from Kiki Rice in Charisma Osborne this season. Um, just tell me about this game. I know there was a there was an injury to Osborne. So what would you yeah, see from this Yeah, that was scary. Um, first off, uh, going to Charisma Osborne, she got injured early in the fourth quarter on a collision uh, going for a rebound. Um she ended up leaving the game. She was down the floor for a little bit. Like it, it was a really sad scene, but she was able to walk on her, on her own power. And then there was an interview with the LA times later um, with the UCLA head coach. And she has her as questionable for the game tomorrow. So that's good that it's not sounding like it's going to be anything long-term because yeah, um, they were really clicking. Uh, there's been times like UCLA is just, been inconsistent like there's times where they're just really good for I would say it comes in halves Um, normally it's in the second half against South Carolina it was in the first half but this game like I felt like it was a complete effort it was just really coming along both offensively and defensively where they were just in rhythm knocking down shots Um, there was one uh, sequence in the fourth quarter where uh, she knocked the ball away from Van Sluten as she was driving to the hoop and then force the turnover later in that possession. Uh, yeah, I just really like their game right now. And again, just hoping uh, Charisma is healthy, both for herself and just where this duo is heading. Like the, they're definite um, Pac-12 contenders, obviously, with how they're playing right now. And yeah, I, I'm feeling really good with Charisma still being my fifth overall prospect uh, right now, just what she brings to the game. She's bringing more efficiency to her three-point shot. Uh, yeah, it's fun times. <laughs> so after the break, Josh and I will run through some statistical standouts from the last few weeks, which includes Celeste Taylor and two prospects I believe we've yet to cover on this podcast as potential draft prospects this season. So we're going to get into that, uh, but stick with us after this break. So let's start off with Kiki Jefferson of James Madison, six foot one combo forward. She's averaging close to 20 points per game around that number. So what have you seen from Kiki Kiki this season? And uh, in, I can't, we wouldn't have a discussion about um, players that could transfer up. I think we've had it on this show, but with Kiki, it's a kind of a unique situation where she could go this season or she could return and go to a um, mid-major or from go to, from mid-major to high-major school. So what have you seen from her and how do you think uh, that plays goes into play? Yeah, it's just so tricky, especially with having that extra COVID year. There's not a lot of prospects at mid-major schools that um, didn't transfer from like a a power five school at one point that that get drafted in the first two rounds. It it takes something exceptional. And yeah, like I would more lean on the side of transferring up to a, a power six school. Like those opportunities are going to be there from people graduating to Um, the transfer dominoes that are no doubt going to come into effect during this season. So I don't know. I've liked what I've seen in her game, like her shooting efficiency in in some games, like the the game I watched this season was the North Carolina game. And yeah, she could just absolutely take over a game with um, her three point shot and just how she sets herself up to get into uh, high chance scoring positions. But 
Um, yeah, right now I still have her as like a fringe third rounder. She's not like firmly in the draft for me. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think there's a, a lot more potential if she went to a, a school where she played higher competition on a regular basis that she could excessively raise her um, draft stock. So against Coastal Carolina, they're a below average team in the Sun Belt. But a couple of days ago, she had 20 points, eight assists, 10 rebounds, won five of 10 shooting from three, seven of eight um, from the line. She gets to the free throw line a lot and very efficient at it. And she also had three steals as well. So there's there's some stuff there with her as a prospect, I think. But um, another mid-major prospect um, is Kashana Washington at Drexel. So this Same wasn't, <laughs> yeah, this, this wasn't a game from this week, but she had like 42 points against Penn State earlier this month in overtime, but she's the, le- the nation's leading scorer right now. So there's probably more attention you'd see from a prospect from Drexel. So she's averaging 28.1 points on 22.1 field attempts per game, which is like leading the nation, but she's not like inefficient. So she's got 45% from the field, 35% from three, 86% from the free throw line. Um, solid passer as well. 4.6 assists per game. I was impressed with her passing as well. Um, because if we're talking about that Penn state game, Penn state just started to send a bunch of doubles her way and her passing ability really opened up the rest of the offense in that game. Um, we touched on it with Penn State's defense being a little bit below average. So they really just committed to stopping uh, Kishana, and that really opened the rest of their offense in that game. So what have you seen from her this season? I know you're a little bit lower on her game than I am. So uh, what yeah, do you see I her as a prospect? It, it's similar uh, to what we were talking about with Kiki. Like, I just want to see it on a more consistent basis, like, staying in the same conference from last season. Like I thought Jasmine Dickey had a, a season out, out of this world and even had like good, per, uh, great performance against Maryland in the NCAA tourney, but she was still late third round. So I don't know what both players, I, I just, with having that additional COVID year, I, I just think it may be beneficial for them and, and any player that's thinking about going into the WNBA to take that opportunity and, and see if they can excel, uh, in a bigger situation. So I definitely haven't seen enough to, yeah, to have her more than just a, a fringe third round prospect, even though like the tools could be there, there's just not going to be enough throughout the rest of the season to make her stand out to be drafted in the first two rounds, in my opinion. So I kind of disagree there a little bit because okay. she, she, she can't return. She's a fifth year senior this year. Is she? Yeah. yeah, she's she's a fifth year senior. Oh, so she's, she's a fifth year. Okay. Yeah, she's fifth year, and I I don't think she um consistency really isn't a concern. She's averaging twenty eight points per game. Um, it's kind of hard to be more consistent than that. So, like I, I she's probably closer to the third round spot for me as well. And one thing about her leading the nation in scoring is every player that's led the nation in scoring has ended up getting drafted like in the last like six or seven years. I think it's like since 2013, 14. So I wouldn't be surprised if a team just says and takes her in the third round. Um, She's extremely effective in the pick and roll, like 95th percentile around there. Um, Excels in the mid range. I'm not as high on her outside scoring ability, like translating. It's not a super quick shot given her size. So the obvious comparison is to compare her to to DeAsha Fair who also transferred up from Buffalo to Syracuse. She struggled with her efficiency um, this season a little bit. So what do you think is like the biggest differential between them? I think Washington's not as quick compared to Fair, but Washington's, I think she's a better um, decision maker compared to Fair. Um, like, a Fair is just more of like a flashy player. Like, she's going to make more of the highlight real plays, and Washington's going to be more subtle. Yeah, her ball... Yeah, I don't know. Just like the main skills that Fair has, like obviously I'm high on her. I, I have her in the first round since uh, when she before she transferred to, to Syracuse. Like I, I just loved her game, mm-hmm. and yeah, like just her ball handling. Like 
I don't know. She uses her size to her advantage. She, she doesn't look at it as something that hinders her uh, and just gets into those open spots. Just the quickness to know where she wants to go and, and get there. I, I just don't know if Washington has it. And at times, like, if there is a, a really good defender, like, it's just an adjustment as well. Like, being in the higher competition, I, I think she is going to show herself to still be a first rounder, had a rough. Time in her last game against Louisville where she went three of 18, but like she, I believe she was like, I, I did preseason stats like before the season. She's like one of three players to average 20 or more points in all in four previous seasons. Like the consistency uh, is there for her too. So we'll see. Cause like, I, I just think her, yeah, her defense is pretty good, but if you're five foot five, your defense can only go so far at the WNBA level. Um, so she's kind of hampered in that way. I just don't know how big of a positive she can be on the defensive end because she can really only defend and I am ones. going to disagree <laughs> strongly there on what impact you can make. Some of the best defenders in the W uh, were smaller in stature and everything, like just focusing on the Atlanta dream, like Ari McDonald off the bench. I, I don't she's, see her. No. The difference is, is Ari McDonald's like a lot more stronger. I feel like in the lower body, she's a lot stronger. I feel like compared to Fair. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. They're they're different physical makeups. I think. I just they think are. Fair's, oh yeah, they are different physical yeah. makeups. But I don't know. I, like, you just never know what what they're gonna like build up during the off season. Like, I don't know. She would be worth taking still, in my opinion. I, I know completely different players, but using size as a detriment on defense that that's what I was more going at and everything like, yeah, you can't make an impact. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I have her I at 12. Mean. I have her at 12. So I'm, I still have her in the first round. Um, the offense is special, special level of offense. Yeah. So let's move to even for her. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was just going to move on to the next player, but we're going to say with, do you have anything else to say with, with, uh... Oh, I was just going to say she fell a little too. Like I thought she was going to, stay closer to the numbers that she did last season with Buffalo and it translate more um, in non-conference play when they didn't play as hard of a schedule. And I, I didn't see what I wanted to be a top five pick. So I have her at 10, uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens in ACC play. But um, who did you want to move on to? Oh, I was oh, one thing about um, fair last season is Buffalo didn't play a hard non-con last season either. And then they also in the Mac, which isn't the, best conference from from a, a women's basketball standpoint just in terms of depth so um it was it's kind of hard to South expect carolina like they played what's wild is like buffalo played a, a harder non-conference schedule than syracuse did this season like they played south carolina and she did really well uh last season they played oklahoma like there, there wasn't like that marquee game like the biggest non-conference game was uh, i believe against penn state like that yeah. was the only one that I remember. So, but plenty of opportunities in ACC play. So I want to move on to Celeste Taylor at Duke. She had a signature game on the row against NC State, number six team in the nation. Um, they were without their number, their their top guard, um, in this game. But Celeste Taylor had twenty three points, eight rebounds, um, two assists. No steals in this game, which is a little bit surprising for her, but she was an impact on defense per usual. The big standout from her statistics was five for six from three. Like, this was her, like, her, her first game with more than, like, four three-pointers made since, like, 2021 at Texas. Like, early 2021 at Texas, which was, like, her sophomore season. Um, they really couldn't contain her, and they go under on, on a lot of her screens. They don't really respect her jump shot because – Historically, she hasn't been like the greatest shooter, and even this season, she's still been inconsistent from beyond the arc. Um, but in this game, this just really allowed her three-point percentage to skyrocket. Because in the seasons prior, she was at twenty-eight percent as a freshman, twenty-nine to thirty percent as a sophomore. As a junior, she was at thirty-three percent, and right now she's at thirty-seven percent. I really don't expect that to stay at thirty-seven percent, but. If she's like a 35% shooter combined with her defensive ability, um, I think it's hard not to have her as a top 15 top um, around their prospects. So 
I know I don't think I don't know if you saw this game from um Taylor, but what have you seen from her this season? I know M on the last episode, I think a couple episodes ago, um, they talked about how she's been a little bit disappointing from a draft standpoint. But what are your like overall thoughts from her? Yeah, this I, I I think M would be just super excited that the game that she had because the thing that's missing for both of us is just that jump shot falling like it, it did in the NC State mm-hmm. game. So if she can have more outings like this one, then she's a, a shoe in for a first rounder. Because I, I don't know, we talked about this before. It's hard to just go off of stat sheets for defensive game. And like every game, like she keeps in check, like the, the person she's guarding and yeah, just overall team def- defense makes an impact and always makes a, an impact on the glass as well. Like the, the other aspects are there. If she can bring the offense. Yeah. The, the, I, I see no reason why she wouldn't be a, a first rounder. Yeah, she's five foot eleven. Has like the highest steal rate among prospects this season. She also has like a two plus percent uh, block rate, which um, that just kind of shows how her instincts are super good. Being able to like make plays at the rim, um, like ground coverage ability, like defending on like at, on, on the perimeter, then like kind of translating that to the rim. And I think what makes her a first round pick for me, I have her at number eleven right now is the upside that her game could become on defense. So, like, a comparison you can kind of make is Brittany Sykes. Um, what's, what's Brittany Sykes' listed height? Let's see what that is. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, Brittany Sykes is five foot nine. So, if she has a couple inches on Brittany Sykes, Brittany Sykes isn't the best shooter either. Um, probably a little bit better passer. But the archetype of being a defense first guard – um, with like lackluster shooting ability is similar to what Celeste Taylor's at. And where was Brittany taken in the draft? I think she was, uh, was she a second round pick? And she like killed it in college too. No, she, no, she was, she was seventh pick. Yeah. She was seventh pick. Uh, she played in a zone at Syracuse, which is a kind of similar, a similar scheme to what uh, Duke runs. They run a lot of, they, they switch a lot, which is a little bit different, but they switch a lot. Aggressive defensive scheme. So, I think she has some ability to be a first round pick this season. Um, no, and what's interesting on Sykes, uh, uh, bringing up that comparison, it wasn't until her last season at Syracuse uh, that really uh, blew up. She got 19.2 points. The previous high was uh, her sophomore season where she did 16.6. And then, uh, yeah, so. It, it didn't necessarily come together. And you said she Celeste is at 39% right now. 37. That's what 37 Sykes shot 39% in previous seasons. She never got that high. So hopefully it, it stays for Celeste where like what Em was hoping for just gradual progression in her game to where she's able to, to earn being a, a first round pick. Cause it's how, how many, att- Oh yeah. Sorry, how many, ahead. how many attempts was uh, Sykes taking per game in college? She was taking 4.4. Oh, yes, that's pretty good. That's pretty good volume. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah Celeste is at 3.3 right now. And, yeah, just – she's only averaging 12.2 points, but Duke has a very balanced offensive attack. Um, Even, yeah, even Celeste – about you. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. She only plays 26.7 minutes per game. She's not even playing, like, upwards of 30 minutes like some prospects are either. So um, it's easier to take her per 40 stats, which are – Pretty good 18.3 points per game on 15.3 attempts. So, and I'll be honest, like, I don't know if it's the same for you, but outside of the top five, actually, I, I would say top six. Outside of the top six, it's kind of hard. Like, there's not like a ton of separation between the players. And, like, I just think outside of Boston, Jones, Jackson, Horston, Osborne. Uh, there's just not a lot of separation from those. And uh, like the draft can go a lot of different ways and in, in what teams select, like even more than last season. So I, I think Blackwell joins that group if she's able to be healthy, but from there, I, I can just see it going so many different directions. Like all three of us had completely different draft boards uh, after the, the top half of the first round. Do we do we both have the same top seven prospects? We have pretty similar. Uh, Sheldon, you both of you were higher on, but so who, I still had have, her in my top eight. But she's who do you have at for me? Who do you have at seven right now? Uh, seven. Let me pull it up really quick. 
because whenever I was filling out my board yesterday, after I got to like seven, I was like, okay, this is good. It's the same. I feel pretty oh, good on my top. a little bit of a riser. But um, Maddie Seacrest uh, has really impressed yeah, me. And Yeah, and, you didn't talk about her. Yeah. Um, last season, my biggest gripe with her was she would have like just really just off the board games where like she's getting 30 points. Uh, like 15 rebounds just like over and over. Mm -hmm. But when it came to bigger competition, the numbers just would not carry over. And, and that is not the case this season. Like just looking at the box scores of the, the Princeton game last season where she was, I believe, held the single digits, the, this season she was she was able to get to the 30-point mark. And yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've really liked her game. Like just the position she plays as a power forward to have the outside shot that she has. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential. So I, I had her at seven uh, on my last draft board. I, I didn't think that was going to happen this season, but I, I just like what I've seen in the games I've watched so far. And obviously really curious to uh, see her in games like uh, UConn and Creighton and uh, Marquette on if she's able to carry it over for a full season. But yeah, I had her at seven and then Sheldon, I had an eighth. I would have had her higher if, I believe I would have had her higher if she like had remained healthy. Um, so I, I just want to see her come back and show what she was doing at the beginning of this season, especially mm -hmm. defensively. She was just a, a stealing machine uh, it's in those first couple of games. So yeah, there's a, a yeah. lot there. So yeah, just after that top, after my top seven, it's super wide open for me. Like, super wide open. Was, yeah. Like it, it can go so many ways. Like you could convince me that, um, from like nine all the way until like 15 or 16 is like up in the air for me. I think um, it goes even of... further. I would, I would go like late first round to like, I, I think 20 was a good mark for you to do, but I think like the first like 20, like nine through 20 could be awfully close to each other. In my opinion, like I, I wouldn't be surprised that there was like a different order, like during the draft, like than a lot of people had in their draft board. So. Be so how does the how does the how, how does the depth of this draft compare to like last season for you? Do you believe it's a little bit better than last season? I do, uh, but I don't think it will show in players making rosters because it, it's just so competitive. Depending on like where player, like I hate that it's more luck on where a player gets drafted sometimes and how many yeah. roster spots they have. Like uh the Phoenix Mercury don't have a first or second round pick. So that third rounder uh, has a better chance than players being selected in the second round and maybe even potential late first rounder, depending on how rosters shape up and, and making a team. So it, it shouldn't be that way. The, again, I, I'm never going to stop clamoring for there needs to be extended roster so players can stay on these teams and grow uh, within the franchise. But as things stand right now, yeah, I don't see that there's going to be a difference in how many players stick from last season to, to this season. And that was the difference between someone like my my um my Hong Shed and then Nas Hillman. She 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 was on um Atlanta, so she kind of had like an easy. Uh, it was it was like a no doubt of that she'd make the roster. Oh yeah, and, and that was yeah. at uh, was it fifteenth overall that they had that I believe it was yeah so yeah I believe it was fifteen and like. Vegas, obviously, like the, their cap space was most of the way filled. Like they, it, it was going to be a competition to make that team. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that was a, a good comparison. And then you go like uh, the wings, they just going into training camp, you didn't think there were going to be a lot of spots open, but then there were players that moved into coaching or um, decided to stay overseas like Bella Allery. That, Mm -hmm. Open the spot for Jasmine Dickey, who got drafted in the third round. So you just never know, yeah, like which players are going to be able to stick. It's it's like we talked about. It, it depends on the team makeup when training camp starts if, if they're going to be able to make it. And yeah, the Dream needed front court prospects badly, so it, it was a shoe in that she was going to make it. And then also prioritization, prioritization is another thing that could come into play this season because like there's players like uh, Gabby Williams that probably won't come over from the French league, so that it sure did spot not sound promising. What what <laughs> how she was sounding oh, yeah. in yeah. uh, postseason interviews? So yeah, that's going to be really interesting. And 
if if that has like a domino effect where some players decide to just hey i'm, I'm just gonna stay the full season into the playoffs um there's a, a lot of leaks that go further so yeah and that like would be that, really that interesting and that would that would be big like for us just from the like from for prospect standpoints it they would, would have i think there could there could be some more prospects that get some opportunities which is uh which could be interesting um not saying it's a good thing, not saying it's a bad thing, but it's definitely it's something both. different. It's definitely both. Yeah. 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 It, it, it benefits some players, but also the players that decided to stay overseas. I mean, it kind of benefits them too. They get rest. So, I mean, they get rest, right? Like, we'll see. Um, yeah. The biggest thing, I hope we have time for me to go over this really quick, but yeah, yeah, the biggest yeah. player I think about that, I think would have had like an outstanding career if she had had rest is Tiffany Hayes. Uh, she's just mm-hmm. someone like the wear and tear, especially over these last couple seasons, uh, has held her back from having potential all-star seasons. So uh, if she's someone that was able to rest and just train during the off season, it, it would have been a completely different trajectory and for the, the Atlanta dream. And it would have been a lot of fun. Like Ryan Howard and Tiffany Hayes in that Las Vegas game uh, last season where the, they pulled off the upset. That was incredible. Like it, it would have been fun to see that more. And we didn't get Tiffany Hayes until like 13 games into the season or something. So yeah, I don't know. It, it just would have been completely different makeup for the dream last season to, and other seasons would have been impacted as well. So um, same yeah, just, goes from same goes for Marine Johanna as well, another French player. I hope we see her this season. Oh my gosh! But if we if we had had her her entire career, like the pass that she pulls off is just, I, I have never seen it before. Like <laughs> some of the things she pulls off is just incredible. I hope we see her this season. That would be a shame if we don't. She's one of the most fun players to watch. From the like the moment she stepped on the court for New York was a lot of fun and. Um, she wasn't some high draft pick either. I think did she end up going undrafted or was she a late? I don't know. Yeah, let me pull up. I think yeah, she went undrafted in 2017, which is okay. A really good find for New York. Um, really turned out yeah. to be a really good find. New York uh, and uh, Chicago uh, have been doing especially good at finding overseas players, especially on the Chicago end, but. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so much talent internationally, and that's the big difference between. NBA and WNBA right now, like even though they have the two rounds, obviously they have the 30 teams and then they also have like the G league going on and then just bigger rosters to have players that don't dress. Like there's just such a huge difference in how we're able to pro- progress professional leagues uh, in women's basketball, yeah. like college yeah. it's at an elite level right now. You, you love to see uh, the amount of talent that's in the league right now. And you can, just with this freshman class, you can tell there's just such a bright future for that. But as far as where these players are going to go after, it's really disappointing to me that um, the league hasn't grown <laughs> more yeah. and there yeah. hasn't been expansion since the dream in, in 2008. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I thought that was a good way to end this episode. So, thank you for making Locked Ones Basketball your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked One Sports Today podcast. It's the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your